athletes uh, throughout our, our culture and history. I'll just do a quick review as we start looking at the individual objects here. As uh, most of you know by now, um, as far as agricultural technology goes, it's how sort of the farmer lived, say, pre-1840. Um, life was sort of viewed in a circle because there wasn't a lot of change as far as technology or how things were done. You pretty much would do things the way that your grandfather had done things. So things sort of were viewed and, and moved in a circle instead of um, sort of how we look to the future and improvements and things today because things have been the same for so long. Um, what happens, and it happens pretty quickly, are the development of a couple significant things. It starts out slowly with things like uh, uh, John Deere's you know, improved plow, but you hit into the late 1830s and into the 1840s and the whole concept of mowing technology and then very quickly after that, after that harvesting technology takes off. And there is essentially a revolution of sorts where the mechanical age begins to hit the farm and there's no turning back at that point. So the life that, that people knew a generation before disappeared very quickly, and it was um, the pace of farming changed, the scale of what a farmer could do started to change, and in almost in five-year increments, there's these dramatic improvements and uh, changes in pr productivity, if you will, on the typical American farm. Now, you always have to sort of look at it through different lenses, if you will, in different regions of the country as sort of things settled and moved west and then the south with slavery is a whole different uh, ball of wax because of the the way technology wasn't really necessarily embraced there because of you know the, the labor force but in any case um, five-year increments it really happens very fast um, through the 1840s to the 1850s civil war slows things down but what happens then is this amazing development of uh, the ability metallurgical uh, casting abilities, and you get to the other side of the Civil War, and the, it just speeds up even quicker. And uh, by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, it's amazing the things that were being able to be accomplished at that time. And the population starts to shift away from agriculture, but the population that remains in agriculture is outproducing earlier generations. You know, today, I don't quite, I can't remember what the ratio is, but there's a tiny percent of the population that is directly involved in agriculture today, and that 1% of our population is now outproducing the 75, 80% that was living on the farm, say, in the 1820s and 30s because of, because of technology. Um, it's pretty interesting that very few people today list their sole occupation as farmer. It's almost disappeared as a sole occupation, say, on the census and things like that. Most farmers today um, have other jobs. <laughs> you know, they farm in their spare time in the morning and the night, and they do other things. So. It's pretty fascinating, and the concept of the family farm, the diversified family farm, where you would have chickens and, and hogs and horses and cows for milk and a vegetable garden and an orchard and honeybees and all that kind of stuff, has gone by the wayside. So it's, uh, the diversity has shrunken down as far as that goes, and uh, the corporate uh, entity is pretty much the ones taking over the mega farming and things like that. We have genetically uh, engineered crops, we have pesticide and things like that, and there's you know big changes as a result of that. Also, the, the tractors and the technology today is, is phenomenal, and the cost of that is also phenomenal. So there's pros and cons to the whole thing. But um, we'll start in this section right here. We've got, as I said before, this area divided into different uh, sort of parts of the process of planting and preparing a field. And uh, one of the things that really hasn't changed too much is the fact that uh, um, breaking open the soil, turning the soil is often the first step. Now the, the no-till concept has been sort of increasing in popularity where you don't do the deep subsoil plowing, but, um, but still the plowing is, is more common than not. So a couple artifacts here to take a look at. We've got a very a fragment of uh, one of John Deere's early um, moldboard plows. Uh, the big thing about it was it was uh, a uh, cast piece that was all in one piece and it made it more durable and uh, something that was really uh, easier to use. Um, some of these examples here are, are, are important ones. The plow um, was different in different regions of the country, but the typical one would have been a combination of sort of the farmer's homemade abilities and then a local blacksmith. So you took sort of two two processes to build one. You had uh, wrought metal, metal that was pounded out as opposed to being cast into pieces, and then uh, wooden pieces that would have been um, made by hand. They either would have had a local person that excelled at making plows or the farmer would have had to figure out how to do his own thing. 
uh, up until the 1830s and 40s when plow production or mass produced um, versions of that started to become more readily available. So the earliest one up on the plinth there is a bar share plow, sometimes called a bull plow. That one dates from the 18th century. Um, it would have been pulled by oxen. And power source is one thing we should talk about really quickly. Um, the main power source on a farm, of course, were people. You know, they, they, uh, the typical farm family and the, and the immediate sort of helpers were, were your labor force, force. And there's a lot of competition in finding farm labor because everybody was in the farming business. Land was cheap, readily available. It took very little for your farm hand to get to the point where he could move on and do his own farm. So typically farms were not any larger than what the ready, readily available labor force could plant and harvest. So as far as growth and all that kind of, it was very limiting because of the limited amount of technology and the limited amount of labor that was available typically in the heat. But um, oxen were the power um, choice for most of the uh, 18th century and for a good portion of the early part of the 19th century. They were um, very economical because they, the food grade could be pretty low to keep them in working condition. Um, in some cases, they could do double duty. Anybody, everybody understand what an ox is? It's, it can be any bovine that has been trained to, uh, to work. So it could be a female that when she's done working in the field, you milk her. Um, most typically, it was a neutered male that was trained strictly for that purpose. And again, very economical because when the oxen could no longer work, you could eat it. So for a very long time, the ox was pretty much the, the, the power source of, of choice. And that's going to change as, as technology changes with the advent of horses and then even bigger horses and eventually tractors and then so on. But in any case, um, the 18th century version up there, there's a lot of different forms of that. We have some in the collection. That's an old saw blade that's been pounded down and made into the, 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 the mold board, which is the part that cuts and then rolls the soil off as you go. Um, very, very interesting variations on these things. You see uh, examples that took maybe several oxen to, to operate, but it, typically of the walking plow, it took one man to, to operate that. Um, having plowed with horses, it's a, it's a sort of a interesting uh, technique. It's very methodical. It's like kind of like mowing the grass. You just kind of go back mm -hmm. and forth and work your pattern. Um, typically, farm animals were trained pretty well. Oxen are both voice and goad command. Horses, um, you have a bit in the mouth and you're working them that way. When you're plowing, you have the lines over your shoulders. You're working the handles of the plow with your hands and um, the pressure on your shoulder and the voice command are what control the horses. The lead horse knows to walk down in the furrow and the other one walks right next to him and plowing straight is always your goal so the, the field, everything ends up nice and even at the end. So the last plow, an example here is Oliver's patent chill plow, uh, developed right after the Civil War. This is the plow that went west. Um, this was a more or less mass-produced plow. You could send away for parts um, to replace it. It was, had standard pieces to it. And the chilled iron, chilled is a reference to the technique used in producing the metal parts. It made them more durable and certainly more uh, non-stick. And that wasn't a problem too with soils and things sticking to these, these surfaces. Um, a typical plow would be polished very, very fine um, typically through use, but you would keep it in good condition that way because um, the plow is stuck and it wouldn't, it wouldn't scour, as they call it. As you go along, the, the, the plow is scoured by the, the earth and it keeps it nice and shiny and the earth just rolls right off it. So these are all good examples of the early walking plows. Now about the time that this was developed, uh, following the Civil War, there are already many patents in place for riding plows and all kinds of other plow variations. So, it really depended where you lived and what business you were in. Out as the, the grain areas opened up in the west, the technology there was more intense, and that's where you saw some of these more labor-saving devices first being utilized and first being perfected. But in the east, where it's more of a mixed bag of, of animal raising and small crop, small grain raising and corn for animal feed and things like that, a typical single-bottom walking plow um, was typical by the time you got to the 1860s and 70s, pulled by a team of horses. Um, and the next step after plowing, we've just got one example here, is the harrow. That's the next step. So we, once you plow over, and the farmer knew when to plow uh, condition-wise. If it was too dry, it would be dusty and, uh, and wouldn't really get a good inversion. If it was too wet, 
then if you didn't get right back onto it, it would dry in the sun and become very hard to break up and make it nice and smooth. So you had to time it just right in the plowing wise so the, so the earth would turn properly and get a, a good furrow. This example dates from the end of the 19th, early 20th century, but there are versions of this, um, this machine going back, uh, or implement going back um, through eternity. Um, mm -hmm. Further back, of course, you go, there's less metal involved. Um, the typical ones of the mid 19th century were sometimes just logs that have been mortared together with spikes coming out of them. Um, we have um, all kinds of variations, um, or even just sort of, you know, tree logs with big sort of uh, stubs sticking out that were dragged across the field. So by the time you get to the 1870s, there's all kinds of choices and the development of the spring tooth harrow, which is pretty much what's used today, which is like a big curved rake that's dragged behind um, the power source. In today's case, it would be a, a huge tractor that would pull, you know, a section of these that's maybe, you know, 40 feet wide. So, but um, this is a typical thing. This would have had a connecting device that would have gone on to the, uh, the uh, what's called the um, double tree, which is the thing you hook to the horses. And uh, in the case of oxen, it would have been a cruder device that they would have pulled along as well. So that was the next step, getting everything smoothed over and raked it. You would typically, you know, do it once, break up your clods, go back and forth, you know, back and forth, and either your last harrowing would be done in the opposite direction that you were gonna plant your seed. So you could see, first of all, the furrows that you're making with your planter or whatever you're working, and you're working with the grain that way. So there's all these different techniques that were, were typically done. Um, by the farmers, things that were handed down from generation to generation. So, um, harrowing was pretty important. Now, in the case there, there's some models of different things as well. Uh, some farmers had field rollers. So once the, the final um, preparation was done on the field, the rollers would help to um, smooth out the field, level it even further. And in some cases, after a seed was planted, they would also roll the field in it to set the seed bed as they well to make sure everything was going to plant and not easily be dug up by birds and different things like that. So uh, plowing and harrowing. Um, the next big step would be planting. Let's go around this way. It's like two harrows. They're not connected in the middle. Yeah, I think that that's what he's saying, that you could put them, you know, kind of together, and that today they're like 40 feet wide. Oh, and yeah, there are huge variations and huge yeah. sort of incremental developments of different planting devices that were used um, beginning in the 1840s on forward. Before the 1840s, it was a pretty simple way of doing it. Um, you pretty much um, did it by hand. Um, and it's interesting as far as how those different things would go and what crops sort of got developed more quickly than others. Corn was the very last uh, American crop to be mechanized, whereas your small grains, wheat, oats, barley, things like that were amongst the first. Um, this particular one is sort of an um, interim style for just a single horse uh, for planting a furrow um, or planting small grains. So the hoppers there you see would be filled with uh, wheat or oats or something like that. And uh, you would uh, pull us along. The ground, the wheel there, the ground driven wheel would, would turn the mechanism there and there would be a hop, inside the hopper a sort of like a, a, a screw type thing that would deliver a steady uh, stream of seeds out the little shovels there at the bottom who would create the little furrow. And if the soil was prepared properly, the soil would just